It's good to be with you again as we prepare Sunday and reflecting upon the scriptures for the 24th Sunday of the year. We're in Mark's Gospel. After our little sojourn through uh, John's Gospel. And Mark gives us an abbreviated form of that very important moment in the relationship of Jesus and his disciples. There he is, near Caesarea Philippi. Notice the name, um, Caesarea Philippi. Two great power figures. This was one of the cities built to show the power of the Roman Empire. Caesar and Philip the Tetrarch the ruler on behalf of the Roman occupying force. So, and all around will be all the panoplies, all the symbols of Roman oppression and power and grandeur. And there Jesus asks his disciples a question. Who, who do people say the son of man is? Who do people say I am. And they give various explanations. But then he turns and says, who do you say that I am? Sisters and brothers, that's a question every one of us needs to ask. Who, who is Jesus for me? When we start a journey of faith group, or the RCIA as it's formally called, we always start with that question. Who do you say that I am? Who is Jesus for you? Because what hangs on your response to that is how you understand yourself as a disciple of Jesus Christ. What kind of church you think we should be? And next week we'll reflect a bit more on what kind of church we should be. But, um, and what is the nature of our mission? If Jesus is a figure of religion, then we have imprisoned God in the narrowness of our sanctuaries, our liturgies, and our pieties. But if Jesus is the new humanity that seeks to grow in the world, if Jesus is the seed sown into the ground that dies to yield a rich harvest of justice, of hope, of peace, of a new way of living community, a new way of living our humanity. In baptism, we are immersed into a new humanity. Who do you say that I am? Am I a small god of religion? <clears throat> Or am I rather the, the hope of a new beginning for creation itself? And Peter, on behalf of the whole community, the spokesman of the community's faith, says, uh, you are the Christ. Very simply, you are the Christ. And then in typical fashion for Mark's gospel, who emphasized that Jesus does not want that broadcast because it will be misunderstood. And I'll be speaking more about that next sun, for next Sunday's reflection. Peter speaks on behalf of the apostles, that community. He speaks their faith. Very simply, you are the Christ. You see, that's the role of Peter and the Petri ministry exercised by the Bishop of Rome. It's, it's not to invent our faith. It's not to give us new doctrines, infallible statements coming from here, there and everywhere. No, that's quite a mistake. He, the Petrine office is to affirm the faith of the people of God and that's a developing 
understanding of faith. We call it the development of doctrine. It's not always the same expression of faith. To give you a very clear example, after the French Revolution, popes emphatically denied that such a thing as human rights. Now, the church is at the forefront of proclaiming human rights. The whole of our Catholic social teaching is framed around human rights. The church was, for something like 17, 18 centuries, accepted slavery as a reality, tried to ameliorate the worst of the sufferings of slavery, but never challenged the ethic of slavery. Now, of course, the church is at the forefront of trying to combat modern forms of human slavery and trafficking. The church justified um, capital punishment, accepted capital punishment. Now, the church very resolutely challenges and condemns all forms of capital punishment wherever it comes from. So yes, the church's understanding of what the gospel means grows and develops. The role of Peter is to express that, to speak to the world and to the church, the distillation of the essentials of our faith and to help us in the journey of developing our understanding. Of what, it, of what the gospel means in the 21st century world. And we have just begun the season of creation. One of the great developments has been for us to understand and to recognize our responsibilities to creation, to rediscover the authentic meaning of, of the first couple of chapters of Genesis that we are to care for, that we are to be love stewards of creation, to care for creation. We have no right to plunder and abuse and exploit the created world around us or the other creatures that we share our planet with. And yet we have done that for so long with disastrous results leading to climate warming global warming and climate change. And so we have articulated, particularly Pope Francis in his epoch-making encyclical Laudato Si, has a kind of new ethical awareness that we have a responsibility to, the, uh, to generations yet to come. We have responsibility, an ethical, moral responsibility to heal our planet, to pass on to our world, to future generations, a planet that is sustainable. And then Jesus goes on to talk to them that he is the Christ, but he's destined to suffer. Peter can't cope with that for reasons I'll talk about more next week. He thinks that the son of David, the long-awaited Messiah, needs to be a victorious king who casts out the Romans and the corrupt leadership in the temple, purifies the nation and takes control. But that's not the kind of Messiah that Jesus is, which is why he says, keep quiet, silent. And why? The one he's entrusted the leadership of his community to, he turns around and says to him, get behind me, Satan, because the way you think is not God's way, but man's. Well, we've all to get behind Jesus, to follow his way, which will not necessarily be our way. If anyone wants to be a follower of mine, let him renounce himself, take up his cross and follow me. 
What is the cross? The cross is not the burden of sickness. That's an inevitability of created reality. No, the cross of Christ is the cost of witnessing to Christ, the cost of working for justice, the cost of being aligned with the poor and the broken, the cost of listening to the voices of the marginalized, the cross of identifying with the poorest and raising them up. And that's a costly mission that we are being given, invited, invited to take up. So if we're preoccupied about saving our own lives, then we don't have a life worth saving. But if we're passionate about raising up the other, say bringing saving love in the forms of, of form of justice, preserving the dignity of, the, of every human person, if that's our preoccupation, if we lose ourselves in giving of ourselves sacrificially to raise up the other, the poor and the broken of the world, then we will find a joy, a fulfillment and a peace, a peace beyond all understanding. We will have truly lived our lives according to the new humanity of Christ. So, James, in this most Jewish of the New Testament writings, he makes it very clear. Faith is not just to be locked away in our religious pieties and our prayers but it has to be done. It, the word has to be done. You do the word. You don't just believe in it. You don't just speak it. You've got to do it. Your actions need to match your words. Your actions need to express the faith that we have. Don't substitute words for action but rather let your words explain your actions. So to do the works of goodness. So sisters and brothers, we have powerful words in the scriptures. We, we recognize as in the prophet Isaiah, in the first reading, one of the songs of the suffering servant. And again, I will look at that next week a little bit more. Go on the songs of the suffering servant. If we're really to follow Christ, then yes, it won't be an easy ride. It will call for sacrifices. But we will find a life worth living as we give our lives in love to the poorest of our world as we give our lives in love to heal creation, to heal the harm we've done to our planet. It means we will be called upon to make sacrifices to change our lifestyle. Just today, as I'm recording this, um, the prime minister here, Boris Johnson, is talking about the um, a new deal for social concern. It's this challenge of, are we prepared to pay? Are we prepared to pay to care for the elderly? Are we prepared to pay to have a good health service for everybody? Are we prepared to pay to raise up the poor? Are we prepared to pay in order to heal the climate, to heal the planet, so that the escalating global warming can be halted and reversed. Always there is a cost. Are we prepared to pay the cost? Jesus was on the cross of Calvary. 
what cost are we prepared to pay? We'll conclude with prayer once more. Make us one, O God, in acknowledging Jesus the Christ, as we proclaim him by our words, let us follow him in our works. Give us strength to take up the cross and courage to lose our lives for his sake and for the sake of the poor and broken of our world. And we ask this through Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen one, who pours out sacrificial love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> and the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, come down upon us and remain with us always. Amen. Amen.